Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers who are working on solutions that face our fellow individual community members, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This is George Coster, your host. This episode is part of our series exploring COVID-19's impact on nonprofits and small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area. Back in April of 2020, when we decided to create this ongoing series on COVID-19's impact, first on nonprofits and then on small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area, we, like you, had no idea how long the pandemic would go on and what the health and economic impact would be in our community. With vaccinations increasing, COVID-19 cases and deaths decreasing, we're now moving into the summer of 2021 with the reopening of the economy and all of the uncertainty of our ever-changing indoor and outdoor vaccinated and unvaccinated protocols and the politics that will drive how we all come back together as a unified or fractured community. We will continue to shine a spotlight on the nonprofits and small businesses that make up the fabric of our community along with the founders and staff who are struggling to deal with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their operations, services, and sustainability until we can all get to the other side of the pandemic. Along the way, we will also share with you all the amazing solutions that our nonprofits, small businesses, foundations, and government leaders are working on to help us all get to the other side of the pandemic and come together to rebuild our communities with more economic, social, and environmental equality. So here's this moment where if we think about it, and we're honest with ourselves on this show, right, George? If we think about it, like we were not interacting with our neighbors experiencing homelessness before COVID-19. Maybe you give a couple bucks on the streets, you say hi, you kind of smile. That's about it. This is our first voice, the founder and CEO of Miracle Messages, Kevin Adler. We are working on a full half-hour show for next week's broadcast with Kevin and two guests to discuss their pilot program, Miracle Money, which provides direct cash transfers to our unhoused community members. We thought it would be helpful if you had more background on Miracle Messages, so we're rebroadcasting our interview with Kevin in Episode 1 from the summer of 2020. Kevin Adler started Miracle Messages in honor of his Uncle Mark, who lived on and off the streets for 30 years. Miracle Messages helps reunite families through helping community members who are unhoused to record short video messages to a family member, volunteers, referring nonprofit and government partners, or formerly homeless ambassadors help record the message. Then, a network of volunteer digital detectives attempt to locate the unhoused person's family to deliver the message. The digital detectives also work with the family and the unhoused person to facilitate a reunion. As of the recording of this updated introduction, Miracle Messages has facilitated over 450 family reunifications. In the rebroadcast of Episode 1, we also feature the voice of Katie McKnight, the Director of Community Engagement with the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. Kevin Adler, founder and CEO of Miracle Messages, joins me now remotely from quarantine via Zoom. Thanks for being here, Kevin. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Good to be here with you, George. So I wanted to really start off with how has the COVID-19 epidemic impacted Miracle Messages reunion services? Yeah, quite a bit. So Miracle Messages is the nonprofit I run. We help people experiencing homelessness reconnect to their loved ones. Our core service for the last five years has been a reunion service. And what we found is with the shutdown in a lot of cities, their equivalent programs for family reunification have been shut down. So in San Francisco, as an example, uh, Homeward Bound is the family reunification service. That's kind of been put on hold for the time being. And to take a step back of what that means, in San Francisco, a person who's in a shelter experiencing homelessness who has a successful exit to get housing, 30% of the time that successful exit is as a result of homeward bound or family reunification. And so suddenly this program gets put on pause. You have all these individuals who are now being put into hotels. There's still a, a huge value and need to help them reconnect to family and friends. So Miracle Messages, our hotline, uh, 1-800-MISS-YOU, has been increasing call volume significantly. We've had more and more families reaching out to us, looking for their homeless relatives. Because if you imagine, if you have a brother or sister or son or daughter on the streets right now, 
my gosh, like you want to know where the person's at, what's going on, how can you show up for that? And then the, maybe the one other thing I just mentioned, George, a couple of weeks ago, I guess five or six weeks ago, the head of the Department of Homelessness reached out and said, hey, you do all this great reunion service work using volunteers as uh, digital detectives to find loved ones, make phone calls, reconnect people with their families. And so that's uh, now live and has only come up in the last five weeks after, as a result of COVID-19. The other two pieces that, you're, that are part of your emergency fund is you've also been working with hospitals, as I recall, to help locate people, because again, that's part of your service. And then the whole mass sanitization of people who are still living out in the open. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for bringing that up. So the hand sanitizer, the masks, the critical supplies, that was our initial response to COVID-19. So everything gets shut down. We don't operate a shelter. You know, we don't have a soup kitchen, but a lot of our partners do. So suddenly they still have a huge and growing client load. We're able to kind of have some breathing room and work remotely. And we're like, well, where can we add value to these partners? Because they're overwhelmed right now. And that's where we were working. We got about 120, 125 shipments, deliveries, and procurement. And we're even creating our own Miracle Messages label of hand sanitizer with a local distillery that's repurposed their manufacturing processes to be focused on hand sanitizer instead of liquors and spirits. And then the hospital piece that you mentioned, George, is a really emergent program that we're excited about. Even before COVID-19, hospitals have kind of a, a term that they use some variation, frequent flyers of the emergency room or friendly faces of the emergency room. These are people often who are experiencing homelessness who use the ICU as a waiting room. So during COVID-19, as you can imagine, where every single bed is just mission critical, like you do not want someone staying in a bed any day, let alone hour or longer than they need to, it becomes increasingly important to try to find next of kin for those individuals, find a support system, the emergency contact. So we've been starting to work with hospitals to do that. They're swamped right now. You know, they've got a lot going on. So it's really a matter of finding the right caseworker, social workers, you know, outpatient services, and then connecting the service there. But yeah, working with hospitals to help people in the, in the ICU reconnect to loved ones when they're experiencing homelessness is another service we've started to offer as well. How can people actually get engaged with Miracle Messages? I know you have a wonderful volunteer, especially your wonderful detective group. And then you've also set up a monthly funding where you're trying to basically deliver care packages to people, socks and the like. But in this time, and a lot of people have time on their hands, how can people actually help you and Jess and your volunteer uh, army to reach more people? Yeah, it's a great question. If you're interested to roll up your sleeves and be a volunteer, we would love to have additional folks volunteer to connect with their neighbors experiencing homelessness as Miracle Friends. So they can go to miraclefriends.org uh, and learn more about that program and apply to be a volunteer. If they'd like to locate loved ones and be a digital detective for good, so making phone calls, writing letters, trying to find family members, who uh, might want to reconnect to a person experiencing homelessness, they can go through our Get Involved page on miraclemessages.org. And then beyond that, we're always looking for strategic help with sponsorships, partnerships, expansion to new cities, fundraising, marketing, cross-promotion. So really, whatever your skill set is, and whatever your kind of network and time, talent, treasure, ties, kind of the, the four T's, I'm online, easy to get a hold of, but just through our website, miraclemessages.org, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. And then going back to the COVID-19 emergency fund, how are you guys doing with regards to, I know you're trying to raise funds to obviously do the mask and the sanitizer and do more outreach. Do you have an active campaign going at this point that people can go to? We do. So they can go to miraclemessages.org slash COVID-19. And that's where you'll see the emergency fund and kind of what that fund is used for. Admittedly, we're not the most talented fundraisers in the world. I mean, we're hard, our, our, my uncle was homeless for 30 years. I got started in this work for him. Our team is a full-time team of two people. And then we have a part-time team of 
two or three people, and then a, a huge network of volunteers and advisors to make this work. So for folks who do want to make a donation and support our emergency fund, where the money is being used to not only ensure kind of the continuity of our core services, our staff, but also to fund things like hand sanitizer, to be able to facilitate these kind of Miracle Friends connections, they can go to miraclemessages.org slash COVID-19 and, and support us that way. And we also have a fundraising link on our Facebook page, which is uh, Miracle Messages on Facebook. Given that we're all kind of locked down, what do what would what would you and Jess and the team like to see on the other side of this? Like, what would what could be some of the best things that could come out of this? Especially now that it seems like we have more focus in the city and the state than and the feds to some degree than ever before on unhoused mm -hmm. uh, community members. Mm -hmm. So, what would you guys love to see come out of this? Well, a couple things. So before we're out of this, I think there's some things that can be done while we're in this that aren't being done right now. So this is the best chance I've seen in the five years I've done this work for layering on other support services to a person who's experiencing homelessness that's temporarily in a hotel. So people hear supportive housing first. Housing first is like kind of the best practice for the country. Housing First is a kind of five-pillared strategy in which secure housing is the first step of multiple steps that then follow. So now is a perfect time for harm reduction, for understanding kind of the drivers of a person's housing insecure, for strengthening their social support network and providing kind of a buffer, accessing information, helping to problem solve. So I'd say number one is layering on support services to people in the hotels. That's, that's one. Number two, right now, is it's a perfect time to be forming relationships with people experiencing homelessness through these tools that we're relying on to communicate with each other as house people, right? So here's this moment where if we think about it, and we're honest with ourselves on this show, right, George? If we think about it, like, we were not interacting with our neighbors experiencing homelessness before COVID-19. Maybe you give a couple bucks on the streets, you say hi, you kind of smile. That's about it. Well, we're now in an instance where we're kind of isolated at, at home, keeping socially distanced from others. Our experience and a person who's experiencing homelessness, though I wouldn't trade my situation for theirs by a long shot, there's a little bit more of a familiarity than existed before. There's a little bit more of like, yeah, I'm isolated too. I'm feeling, I'm, I've been affected by this. I'm, I'm nervous. I don't know what's going to happen. My job's unstable, right? So I think that moment of shared experience provides a gateway to form connection and understanding and recognition. And that's where Miracle Friends is really trying to make the most of that, is to form those relationships. And that matters because once they, whatever comes after COVID-19 with the hotels and the next stage of emergency housing or supportive housing, People are going to need friends and supporters and neighbors who stand up for them and, and know them and say, hey, it's not just we need to house the homeless. It's Joe, he needs to be in an apartment, right? And here's how he got on the streets. So that's what we're trying to build right now is that relational piece and that kind of support services piece so that when the hotel thing ends, there'll be more energy towards getting people permanently housed, which is, of course, what we're all after. Thank you very much, Kevin, for sharing your team's work today. And we're, we're going to make sure that the viewers uh, have all your contact information website. Thank you for sending all of that information as well. And please, you, Jess, the whole team out there, because you're out there uh, working, please stay safe. And uh, really appreciate all your work as we work our way through this. So thanks for the time. Have Thank a you, wonderful weekend. You as well. Thank you. You're listening to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. This is George Coster, your host, and if you're just joining us, in this episode, we're continuing our special series on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on nonprofits, small businesses, and our local governments in the San Francisco Bay Area, and how organizations are reopening. You've been listening to the voice of Kevin Adler, founder and CEO of Miracle Messages. To find out more about their reunion services, buddy system, and to get engaged as a volunteer, go to miraclemessages.org. I think Miracle Messages' term 
Everyone is someone's somebody sums up our community's need to see our fellow unhoused community members as people just like us who need our help. So I think the first thing for us that was sort of an indicator that things were about to change really significantly for us was we look at our find food page on our website as sort of an indicator. And in February this year, that site had about 900 visits. In April of this year, that site had 25,000 visits. This is our second voice, Katie McKnight, the Director of Community Engagement with the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. Since the original broadcast of this interview, the demand for food has continued to expand, with San Francisco Marin Food Bank now distributing 1,300,000 meals each week. The food bank is operating 27 emergency pop-up pantries at schools and community centers to address the massive food insecurity facing our neighbors and is distributing food to between 55 to 60,000 households each week. To help feed homebound seniors who used to visit San Francisco Marin food bag pantries for groceries, they've created the Pantry at Home program to deliver food directly to 9,000 plus seniors. I'm joined remotely via Zoom by Katie McKnight, the Director of Community Engagement for the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. Katie, thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, George. Kitty, since you run the volunteer program and work out in the community, how has the COVID-19 epidemic impacted the San Francisco Marin Food Bank and what are you seeing out there in the community? Yeah, George, you know, I've been at the food bank seven and a half years and we've never seen anything like this before. We've never seen such a rapid increase in the needs of our services. That is something that had we just were not not anticipating it. And we didn't really know what was going to happen when COVID and all the shelter in place really began. And for us, you know, right now we're serving an additional 30,000 households a week. So we've nearly doubled our distribution. And I think that's the, the first thing we're noticing is just how severe the need is and how severely it spiked. And then additionally, it's who those participants are. So we have our participants that may have lost access to the pantry that they typically attended. But really what we're learning now, the more about the community, the more I'm talking to those that are coming to our pantries, it's that this is often their first time needing food assistance. And it's due in, in direct to job loss from COVID or being affected specifically by COVID and, and seeing that shift uh, so much more than it looked like pre-COVID-19. With the COVID-19 and the impact of more families and children asking for food, what have you and your team done to respond to the situation? So I think the first thing for us that was sort of an indicator that things were about to change really significantly for us was we look at our find food page on our website as sort of an indicator. And in February this year, that site had about 900 visits. In April of this year, that site had 25,000 visits. So we started seeing that increase and we knew early on we were going to need to pretty quickly and adjust our services. So we've done that a couple of ways. The the biggest way in which we've had impact in the community is what we are calling our pop-up pantries. So we had over 110 of our pantry sites out of 275 had to close directly because of COVID-19. Right now, as of mid-May, about 88 of them are back online. So we are, we're feeling pretty good about that. But right now, we know that there's increased need. So we've opened these pop-up pantries. This week, we are opening our 23rd pop-up pantry across San Francisco and Marin. And these are pop- our pantries in every quadrant of the city and across Marin, where our families, our participants can go each week to gain access to healthy grains, protein, and fresh produce. When we first started these pop-ups in late March, we were looking at serving about 300 to 600 households each week. Now all of those pop-ups are serving over 1,200, 1,500. We have one pop-up that serves consistently 1,700 households each week. Wow, that's uh, quite a volume. Would you mind sharing with the audience probably one of your kind of favorite stories or moments to the pop-up pantries? Because now more than ever, the food banks are out in the community itself instead of having people come to your site. 
Yeah, I think back to one of the first pantries we opened was a site um, out in the Bayview. And I was there sort of acting as the, the greeter, helping manage the line, answer questions. And we don't ask many questions of our participants when they come to our pantries, but I like to try to strike up conversation. And I spoke to this woman who is a barista at an independent coffee shop and had lost her job. And we were just talking, I was asking how she heard about the food bank, was she familiar with the food bank? And she said, you know, I knew that the food bank was there and was providing food, but it wasn't anything. I never thought I would need food assistance. She asked if I had kids, which I said no. And she said, I have two high school age boys. Do you know how much one high school age boy eats, let alone two high school age boys? And she took a pause and got a little teary eyed and said, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to be able to do my job as a mom and keep my children fed. And I think that's a moment that I've been carrying with me for six weeks now. And it's still, you know, gives me goosebumps and, and it makes me pretty emotional just to think. And that was just one of the thousands of households that we are serving in response to COVID-19. Thank you. That was really great. So besides the pop-up pantries and now you're doing the deliveries to people, some especially seniors, for example, what additional needs are you seeing out there? Yeah. So to your point, we're doing the pantries, we're doing our deliveries to 11,000 seniors. We are also seeing a significant increase in need for CalFresh, which is the SNAP or the food stamp program here in California. And we have a whole team that's dedicated to helping those apply. Um, Last year in March, 39,000 people across the state of California applied for those benefits. This year in March, 94,000 people across California applied for those benefits. So one of the ways we're helping is helping people get access to as many benefits as possible. And we also know that we are facing challenges in food procurement. The price of eggs or the price of protein has increased. We know that we are challenged with recruiting volunteers. The the more pop-up sites we can open is dependent upon our ability to recruit volunteers and our ability to secure sites to have these pop-ups. Let me also know that our participants Food insecurity is just one of the challenges that they're facing in response to COVID-19. So really looking at all of the other agencies that are providing services in San Francisco and and identifying how we can work together, how we can refer participants back and forth to each other so that the participants are getting access to all of the services um, that they need because food is one part of this and it's a pretty, it's a pretty big part, but you know, the effects of COVID-19 on those that we're serving, which, you know, are the most vulnerable populations in San Francisco and now really have expanded to, to being a greater population in San Francisco and Marin. We're trying to, as holistically as possible, meet all of their needs as best we can. Katie, how could people basically get involved with the food bank? There's volunteering, obviously, dropping off food. You guys are running a funding campaign. Could you share a little bit about that? We are, yeah. So one of the best ways to help the food bank is by making a financial donation. So right now, we do have a COVID-19 specific funding campaign, $100,000 match that is helping us to meet the increased need. For every dollar donated, the food bank is able to provide two meals to the community. So the way the food bank works, we purchase tractor trailer loads of product. We work on a really large scale, which comes with a cost. So all that financial support is really impactful to us. Donations can be made right on our website, www.sfmfoodbank.org, and you'll see the big banner right on the top that says COVID-19 support. Additionally, we need volunteer help. So we are staffing volunteers in our warehouse. We're helping us pack all these senior food boxes and bags that are being delivered. We need volunteers at all of our pop-up pantries as they continue to grow and we continue to add these pop-up pantries. And that can be done at volunteering.sfmfoodbank.org. Again, if you just go to our main website, you can get all the links to get involved. And then the third thing that I'm so grateful to be here with you today, George, to talk about is awareness. I think people understand that there is an increased need because of COVID-19. And I think that the more we can share how directly impacted so many San Franciscans and folks in Marin really are by COVID-19. And and we know that recovery is going to take a really long time. And especially for those most vulnerable populations, the more people are talking about food insecurity, the better for us. 
And so Katie, out of this complete meltdown, what do you see are positive things that could come out of the COVID-19? It's like putting an x-ray on our system. So what do you see happening? You know, there's a few ways I think that when we look back on COVID-19 and and sort of debrief, if you will, I think there's, for me, the couple of things that initially stand out is I hope that people can take comfort in knowing that the food bank and these safety net services will always be there and that we can weather nearly anything together. And I I hope that people are able to take some comfort in that. But I would also say that this has allowed us to open up our eyes a little bit on our operating, both the food bank and at the city and governmental level. The way we're operating right now is very different than how the food bank would typically operate. We've had to be nimble. We've had to move quickly. We've had to pivot much faster than we typically would like to. And I think we've been able to be really successful in that. And I think this also gives us a chance to look at food insecurity as a whole and really looking at what are all the factors that can lead and cause an individual to face hunger. And what are the steps along the way? What are the other opportunities we can have as a community to affect change for those that we're serving to you know, help alleviate those challenges, help alleviate that fear, help alleviate the stress that comes with food insecurity. And as a community that is trying to serve our neighbors in need and that you know, I take comfort and I take solace in knowing that we do have the ability to pretty quickly affect really big change. Doubling our distribution in seven and a half, eight weeks is pretty rapid for us. And we've been able to do it because we have so much support. Thank you. So really appreciate everything that you and the food bank are doing. And we'll make sure that people have the contact information on how to engage as volunteer donation, etc. Please stay safe out there as you're out in the community and please keep uh, helping our community feed themselves. Obviously, it's a dire need. Thank you, George. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing. We're all really proud to be food bankers right now. And thank you for letting us share a little insight into that with you and your audience. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Voices of the Community. You've been listening to the voice of Katie McKnight, the Director of Community Engagement with the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. The San Francisco Marin Food Bank and their pantry partners distribute food without asking many questions other than a few basics such as zip code and household size. Additionally, they don't ask participants to show ID or about immigration status, and they do provide food for our unhoused neighbors. The food bank also helps clients to sign up with CalFresh, the state of California's version of food stamps. To donate and volunteer to help distribute food to our neighbors in need, go to sfmfoodbank.org. In this rebroadcast of Episode 1, we heard about miracle messages from founder Kevin Adler. Please tune in to KSFP 102.5 FM to next week's show on July 22nd at 8.30 a.m. to hear part two of our Miracle Messages interview with Jen Roy, Ray, and Kevin Adler, who share with us the Miracle Money Pilot Program. We hope that you enjoyed the insights, points of view, and personal stories from the voices of changemakers and their nonprofits and small businesses featured in this series. To find out more and get engaged with the nonprofits, small businesses, and staff members featured in the series, please go to my website, georgecoster.com, and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews and to listen to the entire series. After listening to these stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to provide a hand up to your fellow community members. I want to thank my associate producer, Eric Estrada, and Casey Nance at Citron Studios, along with the wonderful crew at the San Francisco Public Press and KSFP. Voices of the Community is a member of Intersection for the Arts, which allows us to offer you a tax deduction for your contributions. Please go to georgecoster.com and click on the donate link to make a donation to help us provide future shows just like this one. While you're on our website, you can enjoy our archived past shows, which feature community voices working on solutions to critical issues facing Northern California communities. And you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future shows, as well as shows and events from the organizations that are included in our episodes. Take us along on your next COVID walk by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, 
And we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas. So send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.